Hi, everyone. This is the 50 States High Pointing Podcast and YouTube channel. What started off as a project for a communications class has turned into something that I actually love doing. I have the privilege of providing the platform for people to talk about the extraordinary things they do in the outdoors. High pointing is the challenge of reaching the highest elevation in each of the 50 states. High pointers don't get paid for their hobby. No one is sponsored by an outdoor company and people fit this challenge into their everyday lives that also include careers and family. I found through these interviews that people who attempt this challenge are incredible and genuinely enjoy talking about their experiences. If you consider yourself a high pointer and you want to share your story on this podcast or interview, please send me an email at 50 states high pointing podcast at gmail.com. It has been a pleasure speaking with every high pointer. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the 50 States High Pointing Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren, and today we're talking with Danny from Georgia. Danny, welcome. Thank you, Lauren. So can you tell our listeners what got you into the outdoors and then what got you into high pointing? That's a loaded question that has a lot of different answers to it. I can't really pinpoint one specific event in my life. One of my many passions growing up as a kid was just studying geography, studying maps. Mm -hmm. I kind of Like even for my birthday, I requested an atlas, if you could believe that. Cool. So for me, I've always been intrigued by just the different places around the world. For me, looking at an atlas was kind of like a form of travel. Um, Just seeing that, I just kind of was intrigued and wanted to like see more of the outdoors. But I would say probably in my mid-20s, after I began working full-time out of college, did I kind of tend to actually act upon it and explore more of this country and oddly enough we kind of have one thing in common our first high point um we share um mount mitchell yeah absolutely so i was like why not go big go with the east coast right go with the highest point (laughs) in the east coast so (laughs) that's cool i ended up um actually being up in Asheville, north carolina for work um and i figured you know i heard good things about mount mitchell i that was like the highest peak east in the mississippi right so right i figured you know maybe i'll tackle one point of the highest point of a region so highest point of the eastern half of the u.s and i kind of took it easy i actually like parked at the summit and then walked up to the top but i did yeah, hike to Mount that, yeah. Back, so <laughs> yeah. i did get some steps in so it wasn't yeah. all it wasn't all like easy by any means but mm-hmm. um after doing mount mitchell i figured, okay, that was cool. That was one, but I wasn't really set on necessarily being a high pointer. I mm-hmm. would say that kind of came starting, that was back in 2014. And that kind of came starting maybe two years later when I hiked my second one, which is Brass Town Bald. So my home state. Oh, right there in point. Georgia. Yes, ma'am. So cool. I went there with some friends, hiked up to the um, summit uh, from the, still the parking lot. So, you know, like a mile, mile and a half round trip. It's all right. And just kind of Notice that, okay, I've done two now. Um, maybe we'll see. Make, maybe we'll, you know, I could make a thing out of this. But at the time, I wasn't totally committed to anything. I was like, you know, if I was ever in the area somewhere, if work ever took me somewhere, then maybe I'll bag a peak here and there. But I never really had a bucket list or a goal to do it at that point in time mm-hmm. until probably six months after that. I how to go to Arkansas for work, but I actually booked a weekend in St. Louis. So I actually um, decided on the way to work after my side trip to St. Louis, I would stop at Tom Sock and do the High Point of Missouri. And that made number yeah. three for me. And I was like, okay, um, if I'm going to do three, I might as well go for the other 47. <laughs> so I kind of just started from there. That escalated like, quickly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it only took three Three, yeah. you know, basically three strikes, right? Three yeah. times a charm. So I ended up um, after that going for four, then five, and then five became 10, 10 became 20 until today where I'm now at 43 as wow. of um, about a month ago. Um, wow. And I will say this, Lauren, I honestly, when I was five, six years ago, when I kind of really got into starting doing this as a goal, mm-hmm. I had the goal of doing I would be happy with doing at least 42. Uh, The 42 easier ones, as you know, the Northwest, Alaska, Montana, all those states I knew would be probably out of realm for me. 
But I was like, I'd be happy if I at least made the other 42 and kind of I could, you know, maybe finish there or take my time going the rest of the way. Back then, I had issues with my weight. I also had health issues from the past. So for me, I didn't think, you know, I, I thought that maybe my options were limited or I was kind of making a making a limit for myself and limiting myself and my potential, I kind of underestimated what I could do until wow. last September. I went to Idaho and hiked Bora. So Bora, I thought was one peak that would always be out of reach for me. Um, not that it's the hardest, but it's one of the more difficult ones. Right. Mm -hmm. But I was able to hike Mount Bora and back down within the time it would take an average hiker to do. So I was impressed that I was able to do it in under 12 hours round yeah. trip and actually yeah. make it to the top and not have too much difficulty doing it. Everyone talks Good. about Chicken Out Ridge being such an intimidating point on the trail. Uh -huh. But luckily I came across a young couple that I was like, you all first, you'll go ahead. And after I saw them do it, I was like, okay, I could do this. <laughs> So yeah. Yeah, um, doing that back in Labor Day um, this past year, 2022, and was able to pretty much almost keep up with everybody else. And after when you, after you get off Chicken Out Ridge and make your way to the rest of the top, it gets easier because you kind of know what to expect and then um, make it the rest of the way to safety. So I was like, after that, um, <clears throat> that was one peak I never thought I could achieve or do, but like... Mm -hmm. That was my 42nd one. I recently did Mauna Kea back in November wow, in Hawaii. Cool. And that one was a piece of cake compared to um, Bora. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that you've done some high pointing with your work travel. You incorporated it in, Correct. which is awesome, by the Correct. way. When did you start planning trips to high point? Well, for me, I've done maybe back six years ago. I did a few here and there, but like near where I lived, I was living. Sure. I mean, I lived. I was, I grew up here in Georgia, um, just outside Atlanta and my fourth one, South Carolina, I just decided to do like a little weekend trips, you know, South Surface mountains, probably no more than three hours drive away from Metro okay. Atlanta. So I just made like a day trip out of that and did a few day trips throughout the way. But I would say it really ramped up when I relocated for a job. I moved to Houston back in 2018. Okay. So it brought you um, out West a little bit. Yeah, a little bit further out west, but at the same time, I had no ties to Texas when I moved out there. And it gave me more time to kind of focus on my goals and ambitions. Yeah. I didn't have the distraction of having family around. So I had to kind of create my own mm -hmm. entertainment, my own excitement, my own passions and hobbies and develop those. So without those extra distractions, not that they're like bad distractions, but without those distractions, it, I just had more time on my hands. So I wanted to For fill sure. it up yeah. a space that I knew I could make something out of it. So basically living in Houston by myself, I figured, okay, why not just do more of these trips? You know, one of my other goals was to visit all 50 states, which I managed to complete when I went to Hawaii back in November. I at least have one bucket list goal out the way. But I figured, you know, why oh, no. not at the high points on there while I'm at it? It's a great way Absolutely. to see and experience any state you're in or any city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it takes you to places you normally wouldn't go or like parts of those regions you normally wouldn't visit. So it was really cool to see every unique place, every uh, high point. I learned along the way my challenges, my limitations, um, how to adapt to those challenges and how to like just keep going. I'm a kind of person that's not really a quitter. So does it drag my butt? Just keep my keys are off the mountain. If you want to get me <laughs> off this mountain, you know, well, that's a <laughs> might great not be the smartest thing to do at all times, but I'm like, <laughs> is this a, a do or die? I'm like, I'm only here once. I'm not going to come back into this again. Yeah. So, especially if I've made it this far out here, then I'm going to try and give it my all. And hopefully I'll like, succeed. And luckily, 100% of the time, I've succeeded in my first attempt. Oh, congratulations. Isn't high pointing such a character building activity? Absolutely. You, met, you meet cool people in the community along the way. I've met some yeah. um, high pointers along the way. I forget the gentleman's name, but I met one in Mount Rogers when I was hiking in Virginia. And that mm -hmm. kind of got me really, really into it. That was, I think, my, I want to say it was my seventh probably high point that okay. I did. That like it was around the same time it was back in 2017 and that was around the same time where i kind of decided that i wanted to commit to at least 
hitting as many as I could. Be oh, that's so able cool. That's so cool. Yeah. I, I kind of get like that too, when I'm um, struggling on a mountain where it's like, I remember having the specific thought on a couple peaks where I thought I did not come this far just to come this far. I have got to finish. <laughs> Well, you, you, you do... sent him out Wendy twice, so uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, <I> more, <laughs> that's more commitment and effort than I would probably give myself. Yeah, I had the pleasure of visiting Lone Pine, California twice, two different seasons. <laughs> when you are under the guidance of a guide, I guess you have limited control, you know, on whether or not you go up. I think if we didn't have the guide... Out of ignorance, we would have probably tried to summit that day. Um, not sure how it would have gone. <laughs> um, well, Safety is always the first priority, right? So yes, but I applaud yeah. you for giving it a go again and not, you know, not yeah. calling it quits forever. <laughs> you know, just putting on a pause. Well, so I tried Whitney when there was a lot of snow and there was a big storm, and I remember freezing in the tent that night, and I was very cold in my zero degree sleeping bag. I mean, I could not warm up and I put on all my layers and it just wasn't happening. And I remember telling myself, I kind of accepted that we weren't going to summit that day, that the guides were going to call it off. And I came to terms with that. But I remember saying, when I come back here, it's going to be in the summer. And it was. <laughs> so a perfect weather out there in the summer. It was just a little unpredictable in March. My most difficult one. Um, you would think it would be Bora because it is one of the more challenging ones, but mm -hmm. I would have to say probably Mount Marcy in New York. What time of year <laughs> did you go? Actually, it was in the summer. It was, um, okay. I believe it was either June. I think it was June 2019. So okay. what would that be? Like three and a half years ago? Um, granted, part of it, honestly, I was like probably 40, 50 pounds heavier. So Okay. When you're working with extra weight on your body, that obviously sets you back some. Obviously, in your speed, in your ability and endurance to go far. And I've noticed that losing weight has been a big help with being able to ascend peaks, right? Sure. Um, so that was a big disadvantage going in. But it was also the one day on my entire trip. I did a trip around New England. That was where I bagged like seven peaks in seven days. Oh, cool. Most of the New England states, all but Maine at that point in time, plus New Jersey. So the day I was supposed to go to Mount Marcy, that morning, <laughs> it was a really terrible rainstorm. It was raining all day. And I kind of knew that it was going to be raining all day. I didn't have time to really change my itinerary. So I decided just to go all the way and go for it. So I started out right at sunrise. It was still rain. It was raining. It had been raining for hours at that point in time, but I didn't expect it to be so bad on the trail. So if you're familiar with Mount Marcy, I'm not. it's a trail with a lot of giant rocks, right? Like boulders shaped rocks for most of the way up to the top of the summit. And when it rains, it basically turns into a creek. So I was basically <laughs> essentially hiking in a creek most of the way up. <laughs> Dealing with rushing water, boots soaking wet. Oh no. And trucking along until I got near the tree line and there was a ranger there basically warning people not to go to the top because they were having monsoon like conditions and it, there was lightning strikes in and around the vicinity. And, you know, when a monsoon happens, you kind of just have like a small window of opportunity to like basically get to the top and back down before the weather picks up and gets worse again. But yeah. of course, you know, me being the kind of person I am not trying to quit, I decided to go for it and push myself. So, what did the ranger say when you're at that point where this ranger is telling you don't go any further than this point and you go further than that point? Was there an exchange of words there? <laughs> Not really. Just a more understood level of like, you know, body language and communication. Just like, yeah, I'm going to okay. go for it <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> Maybe I should have given her my info just in case. But I figured, you know, there were a few people on the mountain as well that day. So it wasn't I wasn't alone. OK, and oh, that's good. Yeah. And she did say you could probably make it within a small window of space. Just come back. You know, don't stay on there long. Right. Mm -hmm. But at this point, I must have had, I was getting sickness. I don't know if it was like some kind of heat exhaustion, but I just remember the one memory. Well, I have met, I remember the whole thing, but like the one thing that won't leave my mind is 
just a pair of hawks just flying overhead as I made it to the summit. <laughs> That's a great and I felt like they were I feel like they were sensing like they could smell like okay, you know, the the next victim's coming. You know? yeah. <laughs> like they could pick up that I they wanted me as prey, you know, essentially. It's like not today, not today. I, did, I am not letting this happen. So I stayed up there, took a few photos. And right when I was coming back down, luckily I evaded the hawks, but right when I was coming back down, I got knocked with a strong gust of wind, pellet, like maybe microscopic pellet size hail and thunder. Oh. So I knew like in an instant, like I had to get back off. It was like that window of time where I was like maybe 10 minutes at the top and then making my way back down and below the oh. tree line at least. Yeah. But made it all the way through it was still like obviously the trail was flooded with just streams of water and everything so mm -hmm. by the time i got back down it was sunset so maybe it was a roughly 16 mile round trip trail it took me about 15 hours to do and i was so sick the next day that was the most sick i've ever been from doing a hike i was wow. so i was so, so dehydrated um i had a huge like ph probably imbalance yeah, because I had symptoms that were like, okay, I am losing fluids. I need to just, I, it lasted for an entire day. The next day, I actually did um, what was it? Um, uh, Greylock in Massachusetts. Okay, I just drove to the top essentially, but I was like, you know, even though that day I After felt like that, crap, yeah, why not? I was gonna, <laughs> I was not gonna like postpone or slow down or delay my trip any further. So. Yeah, Bought you were PD like the next day, and I was fine. But it was it was definitely not something I recommend. Definitely make sure. So from now now on going forward, when I do hikes, one of the things I do is I at least try to bring electrolyte water because I really do feel like it makes a difference just replacing those. I agree. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, those vitamins and minerals and within the water that you would lose from like sweating and stuff like that. But that yeah. was one lesson I learned when I did not Marcy. That was, I believe, my twenty third high point at that time. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's that's always a good idea is to bring an electrolyte source. And then, and I know this is not realistic all the time, but if you're able to just leave, be flexible in your summit attempt in terms of time, that is just so helpful. And I, I haven't had that luxury, um, but I, I know that some people have where they can say, all right, I'm going to go to this area and we're going to do these high points. If we're not able to summit on this day, we'll give ourselves an extra day or something like that. I mean, that's always a luxury, but I understand it's not realistic. Yeah. And I felt like with those hikes, I kind of know my body well enough to be where I could kind of know, okay, if I push myself further, it won't be terrible. It'll just feel miserable, but mm -hmm. my body could keep up and I, I, it would be, it wouldn't be out of realm for me. Um, mm -hmm. if it were a hike that I know I couldn't do on my own, like let's say Rainier, I would be with the guide. I would be with someone I could trust Yeah. But for those kind of hikes where I know the conditions are pretty good. Either there are people around or. I could do, I know I could do it a day hike out of it or the weather is otherwise cooperative, then I'll mm -hmm. attempt for it and try to go as far as I can and at least attempt it once. We're capable of more than we think we are. A hundred percent. You mentioned that you lost 40 or 50 pounds in mm -hmm. this high pointing journey so far. What turned that around? Was it high pointing? Was it realizing that that could get you up to a summit faster? I wish I could say that. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, it's not going to be only high pointing, even though training for hiking and doing high points is a big help. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, I had lived in Houston for four years mm -hmm. and Houston is not really the most mountainous place. I mean, I, there are probably more de mountains in Denver, right? Than there are in Houston. Yeah. Houston is the one of the flattest places you can imagine there being. Um, so one thing I did to train or kind of just keep in shape was I had a bicycle. So I just started riding it. I would ride for, I ride up, I would start slow and small. I would start maybe, you know, doing six, seven miles on a bike at a time, wow. maybe like three days a week. And then eventually, you know, gradually grew and I was able to build up endurance and do mile, like 10 mile rides then 10 turned into 20, 20 turned into 30 mile rides at a given time. So wow. that for me, I feel like, uh, conditioned me to 
you're kind of working your lower body, you're working your legs, your thigh muscles, right? Mm -hmm. And I believe that kind of conditioned me. If you're going to be in a place that has a terrain that isn't really conducive to hiking or um, going up in higher elevations, I felt like uh, bicycling was a great alternative. And I yeah, felt like that true. really did help me build up my stamina, my leg muscles to be able to carry myself and carry myself on big hikes. So I, that was my big secret. I feel like ultimately to getting to Bora and completing wow. Bora um, in a single day. Um, mm -hmm. That is still probably my, uh, it, it, although not my most difficult, probably my most proud achievement. Cause that was, as I mentioned earlier, um, one hike that I never thought I'd be capable of doing. But I would say cycling was a big secret in helping me get the get in the shape I needed to be able to uh, ascend and climb the peak. That is fantastic. And it's always great when we find an activity, a physical activity that we also like. And we Absolutely. just have and it just happens to make you healthier. Now being in Georgia, um, the weather's probably not as warm as it is in Houston. It definitely isn't. It's definitely a lot hillier, so probably mm -hmm. not the best. If you're going to ride a bike around here, you need to ride it on a dedicated trail. It's just not safe to ride it on the streets or, yeah. you know, with yeah. all the different road conditions around here compared to Texas. But I would say being closer to home now, being closer to the mountains, it definitely is uh, more of a paradise for doing more hikes. And that's what I hope to do when the weather gets a little bit better, uh, mm -hmm. just go on more regular hikes here. Um, but that is one activity I think that ultimately enjoy. I think at the same time, you know, I love the outdoors. I hate being in the gym, working out. Um, <laughs> for me, yeah. it's like, I could be staring at a screen or in a room next to sweating people that I don't want to be next to sweaty people. I'd rather just be <laughs> enjoying the outdoors, hearing birds <laughs> chirp or, or animals like, you know, just come out of their, um, come out of hibernation as long as they're not, um, the Super kinds hungry. of want to attack me, yeah. but like I enjoy that. I enjoy the nature. I enjoy the scenery. I enjoy just seeing something new. Yes, and not yeah. a blank wall or like some or being stuck in a room. So I, I, think I know hiking is one thing that all you need is boots. You need mm -hmm. our hiking poles are optional depending on the hike, and just a good attitude and just kind of some common sense knowledge. It's not as hard as going. Uh, skiing or snowshoeing or dealing with those kind of conditions, going through, you know, uh, muddy terrain or whatever other mm -hmm. outdoor activities might require. But I feel like hiking is pretty straightforward and something that could easily be done if you're on a well-marked trail. It doesn't take as much yeah. effort. So that's why I enjoy about it. The flexibility of it, going at your own leisure, just taking it all in, enjoying the view and really getting the most out of it. I agree. And it's fun when you can insert some bucket list goals into your Absolutely. hiking, especially when it includes high pointing and pushes you to travel more. I mean, if it weren't for high pointing, I can't say I would ever find myself in Lone Pine, California. Um, high pointing is what brought me to Taos, New Mexico, where I climbed Wheeler Peak and it was yeah. so beautiful. And Absolutely. even um, when I went up to Lone Pine, I thought, well, you know, as long as I'm here, I'll go drive out to Death Valley National Park and visit the lowest point in the country. And that was the first time I attempted Whitney. And then the second time I said, well, I'll just drive all the way up 395 and go to Yosemite. And it's just like this exposure. You just never know where it'll lead you in life. And I love that. And I think <laughs> hiking, um, all it takes is just a minimal amount of research about the environment that you're going into. And the benefits are just enormous. And training as well. I mean, yeah, you got like anything you do for camping, for hiking, just if you're going to go somewhere alone, you kind of just apply the same basic rule mm -hmm. of thumbs and principles. It doesn't take extra effort. Obviously, you know, you want to stay hydrated. You want to have enough water to get somewhere. You want to have a good sense of direction or, uh, you want to have emergency contacts if something were to happen. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but those are things that you normally exercise if you're out alone somewhere, whether it be a trip, even if you go to Disney World by yourself, you kind of need to yeah. know all that, right? And do all that. <laughs> yeah. But, but like, I'd rather just go hike on a hike versus like go into an amusement park in that sense. I know. But I know. once you do one and kind of just have a thirst and wanting to do more and more, you get more comfortable with it. You know what to expect. You know what to do. You know your body. You know your. You know it better than you thought you did. So I think you could kind of like work towards healthy goals and just trying to like accomplish more and more each time. And, mm-hmm. you know, work starting small and working towards bigger goals. It's helped me to do that. Um, I'm the kind of person that doesn't like to keep the status quo. I want to be challenged in that regard yeah. and keep doing more and more. Um, I would say this high pointing and especially, you know, when I was seeing all 50 states, I enjoyed spending time or taking time to do a hike. I enjoy the culture of a place I go to. I enjoy experiencing just the highlights or the most popular spots in a new place I visit. Mm-hmm. But I like to allocate time towards hiking. Um, when you were talking about riding a bike and how your options, I guess, for training were somewhat limited in Houston, I can relate to that because... Before I climbed my first mountain, which was Rainier, not my first high point, but um, Mm -hmm. I was coming from central North Carolina, and so not a lot of hills to train on. Um, And I used the Stairmaster in my gym, and so I would put my backpack on, the one that I was going to carry on Rainier, and I put enough... I didn't put the exact equipment in it because that would just be over the top, but I put enough weight in it so that it was equal to what it would be with the equipment. And I practiced, you know, just climbing up stairs with that pack for a long time. And I was so confident after a while that when I got to Rainier, I was just like, Oh, I've got this, you know, I can, I can go up hills with this thing. I'm good. And I was, until I had to come down and my body was just like, what is this motion? We haven't gone down. (laughs) We've only practiced going up. And so I, I think that that was one of the biggest challenges. You can do all this uphill and stair training you want from a flat place. But when you go down, there's just another set of muscles that shocked my legs. I will say this though, out of all the, all the high points I've done, all 43 I've done so far, I would say Bora is one, just like you're describing, one that requires some downhill, I guess, awareness or mm. maybe some training or exposure. I would say that that's the one peak and only one peak I can recall ever doing where it took longer to go down than it did going up. Really? And what was the reason? Was it like loose rock where you had to be super careful? Very loose and very steep at times. I also bought a new pair of boots because I felt like, you know, grip is very crucial and critical to have, especially on Bora. So I wanted to lose a good grip. And it might have not been. It was the same size I had ordered before with my previous uh, pair of hiking boots. Mm -hmm. But I feel like they were a little bit loose on me. So I made the mistake. And I would definitely do this, especially if you have above the ankle boots when you're hiking Bora. I would wear socks long enough to at least go above the top of the boot and at least tighten, you, you know, lace your boots up as strong as best as you can. And also ones that fit your foot exactly. Cause going down was not, it was not a cakewalk. It was painful. Um, wow. Like every step I took, I would kind of like shuffle down. Cause like you said, there's a lot of loose, loose scree. It's a very yeah. steep trail, but um, every step I took going down, it would either be scraping the back of my ankle or jamming my toe into the front. So I was oh, getting gosh. it on both ends of my foot to where oh, I was basically man. limping for the last two miles down the trail. <laughs> but I knew I, I knew I couldn't do anything. I was powerless unless I made it back to my car, but it was, mm-hmm. I couldn't. I ended up riding my bike when I got back to Houston, maybe three days after that, but it was the painful three days. I had to like maybe do two days on my bike just to feel like I was back to normal, but it was the worst pain I ever had in my feet, at least, um, from hiking, I guess you could say. And that was one thing I definitely did underestimate. 
at least I yeah. took the amount of time that would take an average hiker. So I at least kind of kept towards that because even before, even if I did Bora or, or not Bora, but Mount Marcy or Mount Elbert, where it was heavier, I was able to complete the hikes, but I was not able to complete them within the average time that, you know, if you Google a hike and it says, okay, it takes an average hiker this amount of time to do it, it would take yeah. me easily like two or three hours longer than that. Okay. So Bora was really the first hike I remember doing, first big hike where I actually completed it within that average time frame. It didn't take wow. me longer than average. Yeah. Um, being able to uh, get there and do that and achieve that was a huge deal. If you were to ask me what my plans were for the next seven uh, peaks to complete that all 50, I would say I'm probably not sure at this point in time. I was, I, I said I would be happy with doing 42, but I ended up beating it by one. So I'm standing at 43 now. Yeah. But I figured if I was able to do Bora and what's to stop me from at least trying for the others, even if I don't make it to the top, at least give yeah. me the go. Um, but I do feel now being at 43, close to the finish line, most people would probably rush to get to the end. But I, I feel now, you know, that I've kind of hit my minimum goal of, set, you know, my, um, at least satisfied at a minimum with where I've gotten to now, I feel like I could kind of take my time and just work towards maybe doing one here and there uh, for the point mm -hmm. in time. But I'm not in a huge rush to uh, wrap it up at this moment in time. No, they're not um, going anywhere. So that's right. 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 That's I, don't, I, don't <laughs> I, I, I heard the same thing too. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's different pros and cons with each of the next seven. So the ones I have yet to do are Mount Whitney in California, Kings Peak, um, Granite and Gannett, then Rainier Hood and Denali. I think for me, probably Whitney. I don't know. I mean, Whitney is, you could tell me, but there, I know there are challenges with Whitney. The thing is, is that most of the hikes I've done, as I kind of told you before, were all solo or most of the, I should say, high points I've uh, been mm -hmm. to. So the other seven, I feel like I would at least need to use the buddy system and be with someone. So one, it's kind of like, and that's the good thing about the high pointing group too, is that you could always coordinate with people within that uh, yeah. circle to um, kind of uh, buddy up and do a hike together. Yeah. But I would trust being around with someone, whatever I'm doing, any of those other seven. Um, I don't know if Whitney's one that is possible to do in a single day. I've heard some people do it, mm -hmm. but when you do an overnight hike where you do require the use of camping equipment, you're just putting more weight on your back. And I feel like that requires more preparation and training to be able to do that, be able to work with more, um, and carry more on your back when you're very, you're doing big hikes like that. So for me, I feel like Wendy and Kings would probably be the next two, but it would mm -hmm. require more work than what I've put in so far into uh, completing this goal. At least you know that. I think that there are a lot of people who just go, oh, I'm Denali, I just, I got to do it. And they're coming, they're starting at zero, but you have the awareness of what these tests really, really entail. And Whitney it sounds like, you know, based on your experience on Mount Marcy and Bora Peak, and I'm sure, you know, the other ones that you've done, um, it sounds like Whitney, really, because there are a lot of options on Whitney. So you can do the John Muir Trail, you can do the Mountaineers route, and then there, you can do the East Face or East Buttress. Those are technical routes. You mentioned going with a buddy, and th that's always a good idea on these peaks. And one thing I like about going with a guide is that they take care of the logistics for you that are sometimes complicated, like permits. And then you go with the team and the team is kind of chosen for you. It's the other people who signed up and they are all, in my experience, they've all been very supportive and like-minded people who are all trying to get to the same goal and want to work together. And so it was a really good experience. And, and you make friends that, you know, I, we all shared phone numbers after Rainier and everything. 
some of the friendliest people I've ever met were just random strangers I met on hikes. I think we all really? just kind of share a common, even if they're not high pointers themselves, I think we just all kind of share a common interest in seeing and experiencing nature and just knowing of working towards something and, and being paid for with beautiful views, getting rewarded yes. with those beautiful views. Yeah. I think make up for the time it takes and the effort and energy it takes to reach that um, apex, reach that um, point wherever you're going, or whatever summit you are trying to attempt. I'll say that just for anybody, I guess, you know, people just starting out or people who had no interest in hiking who might be interested now. I mean, those would be my takeaways that with all the work and effort, I think people underestimate themselves, but I'd say go at your own pace, work towards it. If you find it enjoyable enough to where the hike was worth every moment, then keep working towards it, make a hobby out of it, build a passion for it. Also note that you should always be prepared, you know, at least enough water, water being the most probably vital thing, yeah. water. And, um, if you're drinking water, hydration tablets, if you're not using electrolyte light water, uh, definitely come into play, come in handy. Um, knowing obstacles and what to expect, knowing how to overcome or tackle those obstacles and also the risk involved. Um, I will say this and you could probably agree with me, but I don't think there's ever a possibility where you are hiking where there's never a risk of maybe rolling your ankle or spraining your ankle. Oh, I think always. at least every hike <laughs> I've done that's been, I've had close calls every single hike I've done to where I've almost yeah. rolled my ankle or points where I have gotten minorly injured where I've basically fallen and scraped my leg or twisted my ankle where it was excruciating pain for maybe 15, 20 minutes to where my body went back out of shock again and I was able to keep going. But what you just kind of know how you can do your body in limits. What's ha what was that? What peak was that on? Oh, Humphreys. <laughs> <gasps> no. So, yeah, that was actually my very first high altitude hike. That was my ninth high point. Uh, did it back in 2017 around Thanksgiving. Uh -huh. um, I was up at the top and I actually ran into this young guy who basically caught up with me, just sort of some random guy on the hike. And I was like, you know what? We're the last two up here. It was very windy, really cold at the top. Yeah. And it was probably like around, I would think 4 p.m. by the time I hit the summit. And I knew like it was going to get dark in a matter of like an hour, an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to be up there alone. I heard risk of being, you know, I heard there's like mountain lions up there and everything like that. So I didn't want to be left alone. Up the up there. That was the only wildlife I experienced on Humphrey. <laughs> Luckily. So this was the crazy thing. So um, I just told the guy, well, because we kind of hung out at the summit. But he was like, you know, I'm going to work my way back down towards the saddle. Uh, but I was like, okay, cool. I'll only be up here for maybe 10 more minutes. Just wait on me. Um, and then we could go down together. And he was nice enough to wait on me. But you don't get a really, you don't really get a signal up there with your phone or anything. Mm -hmm. And I just told me, no, basically expect me down at this amount of time. And I'll fly you the rest of your way down. So basically when I was getting off the first false, probably, you know, there's like four false summits before you get to the summit, real summit. Yeah. So I think I was coming down from the real summit and then I went, around that first fall summit and i had slid on some rock or some scree and it was like i almost did like a i didn't know i could do splits so well until that day <laughs> i basically just split <laughs> what a like terrible this, place right? to find that out <laughs> right i did like one leg forward one leg backward and i no. think i twisted it i'm trying to think if it was my ankle or my knee but i no. just heard a big like cracking sound and i was like crap this Oh, hurts no. like a mother but also the same time i'm like how am i gonna get off now this is like it yeah. hurts so bad like i'm limping at this point quite a long way at least five miles uh to get back down five miles yeah. or so and for the listeners who don't know it's kind of a boulder scramble somewhat as you get to the top of humphreys um and it the entire path isn't a boulder scramble. There are just some sections up to the summit. So it's never a good place to twist your ankle, but this is a particularly Especially bad Especially an hour before it gets dark. <laughs> that too. I mean, really everything was just kind of against you. Right. right and you're alone. I, I was like, oh my God, okay. Am I going to have to get a helicopter to fly in or a helipad <laughs> or, um, 
Or am I going to be able to have enough clothes, to have enough water for the night in case I get straight up here for a night and no oh one comes gosh. to find me? Oh my gosh, if the mountain the lions day. eat you, yeah. That was the yeah, early like mountain lions eating me, so thank goodness. So I was able to, after like 15 minutes of excruciating pain, the pain subsided enough to where my leg felt almost normal again. So I was able, luckily, to meet the guy. He was patiently waiting, probably for an extra 15 minutes and he needed to. But he waited for me at the tree line. And then we made the rest of the way down. It was pitch black out. And I just remember the creepiest feeling. It didn't quite end there. But the creepiest feeling was when we got closer to the trailhead in the parking lot. I saw all these, like, glowing eyes. Like, maybe six, seven, eight pairs of glowing eyes staring at us. And I was like, is this this the end for us? (laughs) But luckily, we flashed the right. We flashed the lights on them, and I think they were just what? Where were they? Um, did they have like I guess caribou up there, something like that, or elk? Uh, some kind of yeah, um, yeah. Uh, deer-like creature. But it was just um, a bunch of those that were just grazing right by the parking lot. So luckily, yeah. uh, we were unscathed, and we saw no mountain lions up there. Oh my god! That would have been that been. up there. Yeah, they're, I heard that too, right? I don't know yeah. when they, do they hibernate at all in Arizona? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it snows. But yeah, yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. It does get cold up there, but it mm-hmm. was around November time. So I'd hopefully they had hibernated by then. I'm not sure. Probably about, well, I would say when it was at the top, probably like three thirty, four 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It was probably like just a, either right around freezing or just below freezing. It wasn't oh so, gosh. so bad. There were small, maybe remnants of snow, but it was actually pretty dry. You really don't quit. Not that you had an option of quitting because you had to come down. (laughs) Right, right, exactly. I had to come down one way or the other. (laughs) Right. I was determined. I was determined to get there on my own. (laughs) Wow, that is wild. Well, that's cool that you met someone to, to, you know, walk down together with. That's certainly helpful. Absolutely. That's what I normally have done when I've done these hikes. I mean, I think most I would be physically capable of doing on my own. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I like the solitude. I like just having time to like recollect, think to myself, just, you know, be in my Zen. It does, it is nice if, if you are going to go it alone to at least be there on a day where there are a lot of people or at least team up with people yeah. and at least um, let them know, okay, I'll be up there or my plans to be up there. Or if you don't see me, um, you know, make sure to alert someone. But um, just kind of develop those connections and tr- develop that level of trust along the way. Um, mm-hmm. but everybody's ever met, ever met has been very supportive of, um, at least just sharing the moment with, uh, with you. That's so cool. So when you tell friends and family that you climb the highest peak in every state or you're trying to, what do they say? I think a lot of them are like, um, great for you. Um, that's not something that I would want to do, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I'm glad you found something that you enjoy doing. And I mean, otherwise they're very supportive, not that they would ever want to join me or some people think I'm crazy to be like, how the hell did you, um, were able to do this or hike a full day, like 12 hours or 10 yeah. hours. That doesn't sound like they find it hard to believe. And I'm like, well, I've done like at least seven peaks that have at least taken me 10 hours each. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't like to me, I, I know a lot of my friends and a lot of people I know, they think a long hike is one that's over two hours. Maybe that is a common definition for a long hike. Yeah. But I find a long hike to be one that takes like eight hours or longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, a normal hike is two to four hours. Right. (laughs) A short hike, if you're going to call a 15 minute hike a short hike, it might as well be a walk at that point. (laughs) Right. Yeah. So if someone were to ask you, why would you do that? What would your answer be? I think for me, it's just knowing where I've come from in the past, just knowing the obstacles I've had to overcome, just with my history, my medical history, as well as being able to like be in this weight loss journey as well. I think for me, it's just kind of proving to myself and pushing myself to my limits and knowing Mm -hmm. and, and, and basically taking on new challenges. Like those things really do build character and give myself more confidence in myself and more trust that I could achieve something greater than I could have ever imagined or hoped for. I'd say anyone who has any level of curiosity into doing something like that, this is a good place to start, honestly, Mm -hmm. uh, with a hiking goal, because it puts you in far out places. Like, you know, you could be in the middle of Kansas. I mean, Mount Sunflower isn't anything worth bragging about at the same time. It's like it's taking you to the middle of 
a remote place that you normally in a corner of the U.S. that you normally wouldn't see uh, just passing through. I think I know the answer to this, but which high point is your favorite? Honestly, well, you might know the answer, but I would say there are different reasons. It's really hard to choose. I would say from a sense of accomplishment, definitely Bora. It definitely Mm -hmm. is one of the prettier ones I've been to, but I would also say Mount Albert was pretty cool too. And Honestly, not for the peak necessarily itself, but for the time of year I went, Mauna Kea in Hawaii. As I was there in November, I went there when it was the very first snowfall of the season. And I went there, I hiked it the day after Mauna Loa erupted. I got to see the plume of like volcanic ash and smoke and everything. The rangers were discouraging me from going up the mountain. Again. It's hot in Maine was pretty good too. Yeah. It was a beautiful hike up, you know, the end of the Appalachian Trail. Right. Beautiful. That's very significant. Yeah. You can you kind of like, well, if, depending on which trail you take, you kind of hike along a stream for most of the way. And then you're climbing up some boulders and making your way to the actual summit and end of the Appalachian Trail. Um, and you get a beautiful, depending on the day, you know, or the, the weather, you can get a beautiful view of pretty much that whole area of Maine. And maybe I think you could see parts of Canada from there, I want to say. Really? Um, from the top of Katahdin. Yeah. When, um, when the weather's good. So that was another, you know, sense of accomplishment too. Do you see any hikers finishing? Yeah, there were a few that were doing it. Um, the whole Appalachian trail that were completing it there. So probably like three or I think maybe like three or so that I met along the way that were completing the trail. Yeah. Wow. It, was, it was really cool to kind of join them. Um, and kind of just, you know, see them like accomplish one of the biggest travel goals that anyone could take on. Yes. Um, yeah, I agree. That was one of my favorites. Um, and then one more um, southeast, I'd probably say Mount Rogers in Virginia. Probably okay. one of the prettier high point mm-hmm. um, trails you could do in the southeast. I did it when the leaves were changing. So oh, I think that beautiful. just kind of added to the visual. But yeah. it was an incredible hike to do. The summit itself, there's not really much to see because it's right because it's a wooded, basically, okay. uh, summit. But the trail you take along the Appalachian Trail, the passing the horses, the ponies, getting there um, was a pretty fun hike in the place. 